going to start with our cortex. Um, we're kind of dividing this up today between Tina and me, and she alluded to some of these, but what I want to impress you with in this slide in particular, other than the text in Luke 8 that Tina mentioned, the one with the seven spirits cast out, we have so little on Mary Magdalene, it's unbelievable. Less than Mary, the mother of Jesus. Now there are more references, but like if Matthew repeats what Mark has or Luke repeats what Mark has, I'm not gonna count it. So as far as independent sources, one, two, three, four. So, uh, you know, I wrote a book on Mary and I had nine references, right? Basically, when remember my slides on Mary. But let's look at these because she mysteriously appears and disappears. And I don't think that was accidental. Uh, in fact, I think it was somewhat intentional. We are told that this group of women who are at the cross looking on from afar, that they are the women who followed Jesus in Galilee. And in Luke 8, which Tina mentioned, she not only follows Jesus along with Susanna and Joanna, who are well-placed, high-born women with good positions and some degree of wealth and influence, they're bankrolling the movement. So for her to suddenly appear in Mark, our earliest gospel, out of the blue, you're at the crucifixion, and suddenly also women looking on from afar, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the Younger and Yosis, and Salome. Now, I'm saying that that's Jesus' mother because he's introduced her in chapter 6, verse 3, as Mary, the mother of James and Joseph. This is a very unusual name of Joseph. Uh, Yose in Hebrew only occurs three times on, in our inscriptional evidence. It's not Yosi or Yosef or any other nickname. And then Salome. So this is a pretty intimate group, and it stays intimate because there are other women. In fact, Joanna is mentioned in another case, I think in Luke, as also being there. And I'm sure Susanna was there too, unless, you know, for some reason she's out of the picture by then. So at the cross, suddenly this woman shows up from Magdal, named Mary, next to Jesus' mother. And I think, and his, uh, maybe his, his brothers are there. I think James is there because I think he's the beloved disciple. I don't think the son of Zebedee is the beloved disciple. He's fled, believe me. They all forsook him and fled just in the previous chapter. He's not suddenly courageously showing up at the cross. He's hiding. He's a fisherman. And certainly, I don't think Jesus' mother was handed over to John, the son of Zebedee. I don't dislike the guy. I just think that's a, a legend that grew mainly to further hide James. And I'll talk about that. Uh, in my other lectures. Then we go to verse 47. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Yose, saw where he was laid. I think these two are mentioned because they were there, and the sister. So this is the intimate family. I'm not arguing that she's his wife, but she's considered part of the family on some intimate level because she's clustered with the mother and the brothers. And then, most important, 16.1, when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome brought spices. So you have Mary Magdalene, the mother, I believe this is Jesus' mother, mother of James. When you say mother of James, that's James the just, and I think it's certainly the mother. Mark doesn't want to emphasize that. Luke, actually, if, if you remember yesterday, or was it the first day? I can't remember now. Uh, yeah, it was the first day. Luke takes out the names entirely and just says the women from Galilee. Now, if they're going to anoint him, they're going to wash his naked body. They're going to pour oil on it. They're going to get all the blood and dirt off, and they're going to prepare him for burial. This is something that the family does, his mother, his sisters, and others that are intimately close. It doesn't make them married necessarily, but it certainly means she's not just extraneous. And then finally, John, 
And this was also mentioned by Tina, and I'm glad she sees it as four women, not three, as I do. Standing by the cross where his mother, notice he doesn't even give her a name. So people say, well, that can't be the mother of Jesus because he doesn't say she's the mother of Jesus. Uh, here it's his mother, but you don't even give her name. Listen, the family's getting played down, folks. We've seen that. The family is getting played down. His mother's sister. And here, I think it, it's in two pairs. Most uh, Balcom and others argue this. There's two women, Mary and his mother's sister, and there's Mary, the wife of Clophus, and Mary Magdalene. So his mother's sister is not Mary. Let me go back to what happened. Let's see. His mother's sister is not Mary, the wife of Clophus. Now, if Clophus is Joseph's brother, which we have from patristic records, then she's also an intimate. And these are the ones that stick with Jesus. I believe James is also there. I think Yosef. The other two boys could be too young to be there. We don't know their ages, but these two are there and Mary Magdalene. So I think this is four women likely in pairs of two, and they're at the cross. Um, let me go on. This is a painting that is done by a fairly unknown artist, but uh, it's hanging in the Methodist Church at Myers Park in Charlotte, and, and it's huge, and it's in the stairs going up to the sanctuary. And I've I just can't walk by it without, I'm just stunned by the picture. Uh, I have the artist's name uh, written down, but I wasn't able to find it easily. I wrote it down on a piece of paper somewhere, but I will find it because he does other things you might be interested in, if any of you are interested in this picture. I took the picture of the picture, so I guess I have the rights to give you this picture. Um, I just, uh, I look at it, I, I'm kind of speechless taking Jesus down from the cross. I'm sure he was more bloody than this shows, but this might even show that they cleaned him up a bit. I take it this might be Joseph of Arimathea, and she wants one last moment with him. Some have suggested this could be the mother, but I think she's being portrayed as Mary Magdalene by the artist. And uh, what would be her thoughts? Can you imagine the one that she had accompanied and the one who, to whom Jesus is going to first appear. Now, I consider this the most precious bit of the New Testament having to do with the resurrection of Jesus. This account, the first 10 verses of John 20, not the verses after, and not the verses in the rest of the chapter 20 or 21, just these 10 verses, I believe are an intact account. If you want to know what happened after the cross, read these verses. First of all, notice some of the differences from Mark, but especially from Matthew and Luke. Do you see any angels? Do you see any mighty ones rolling the stone back from the tomb? Do you see any earthquakes? Do you see anybody in the tomb, either an angel or a young man? And yet it's on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark. Now, whether Mark's account can be reconciled with this, this looks like she's coming alone and it's very early. And I think she absolutely cannot wait to get there because Jesus has been in the tomb, I believe Thursday, Friday and Saturday and now Sunday morning, she's coming. I have a different view of the day of, day of crucifixion. And she saw that the stone had been taken from the tomb. So somebody has already been there. This is like, to me, it's like a newspaper account. Tell me exactly what happened, Mary. Well, I went to the tomb. It was really early. I remember it was still dark. And I got there, and the stone was already removed. So notice she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, who I think is James, but possibly the beloved disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. 
Boy, that is just the obvious assumption. You go to a tomb, you had been there the, I think the Thursday, but let's just go with Friday for now, the Friday before, and you know the tomb was sealed, you know he's there, and now somebody's moved him. Peter and the other disciple run to the tomb. They're in Jerusalem, obviously. And one outruns the other and reaches the tomb first. And stooping in, he saw the linen clothes lying there, but he did not go in. Then I believe it's because it is James. Uh, Zebedee would have no problem going in because he's a fisherman. And he doesn't have this vow of holiness or that James had uh, wearing the priest's mitre and so forth. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen clothes lying and the napkin, which had been on his head. By the way, tomb of the shroud, Gibson and I discovered by accident. You know, I start my book by uh, the Jesus dynasty by saying most of the great archaeological discoveries have been accidental. This one certainly was. We were hiking in the Valley of Hinnom in the year 2000 in the summer. I think it was in July after digging at Suba. And we came across a freshly robbed first century tomb, never been disturbed. And we went in it, and it was devastated by the thieves. They broke an ossuary, scattered bones. But in one of the niches where they just saw some blackened substance, we saw there was skeletal remains with the burial shroud. And guess what? Two pieces, not like the Shroud of Turin. There was a napkin for the head and a cloth for the body. Isn't that interesting? So talk about a newspaper account. I really don't think this is very theological. I don't think this account is theological. It wasn't lying with the linen clothes, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. He believed what? He believed not that he's risen from the dead, for as yet they did not know the scripture. They're going to learn that later. He believed that the tomb's empty. Then the disciples went back to their homes. If you just take those 10 verses, I think we have the earliest account of resurrection. I learned this from James Schauberg, whom I'll talk about later. I think it's an incredible account. It rings true. The burial party is Joseph of Arimathea and his entourage. Um, they put him in a temporary tomb near the cross, according to John because there's an unfinished tomb there. It's not Joseph's tomb in my view, even though Matthew says that, but he's the only one who says it. John says it's a burial of emergency. What do you do with the body when Passover is going to start literally in an hour or two? And you've already, you know, you've already prepared your family for the Seder that night. And I think when at, at the next available opportunity, not in the dark, but at the first of light, um, uh, the body had been removed and, and put in another tomb, maybe Joseph's tomb. Now, look at this phrase, and they went back home. Here, I, I love this uh, image of Mary uh, just sitting at the tomb. The artist is imagine her, imagining her maybe pausing for a minute. The tomb is not accurately portrayed because it would just have a little opening like this, but that's okay. I just love the image of her sitting there thinking, where have they taken him? That's the natural reaction. Where is he? Now, let me switch to the Gospel of Peter. It was a portion of a lost gospel. Here's a piece of it found in 1886 by a French archaeologist in Upper Egypt, and it ends like this and just breaks off. Now it was the, let me tell you what goes on right before this. Mary Magdalene comes, she's called a disciple of the Lord. She finds the tomb empty. It's very, very similar to what we just read. And then we get this. Now it was the final day of unleavened bread. So this is seven days later. And many went out returning to their homes since the feast was over. People forget that Passover lasts eight days. You have the Passover, the evening of the 14th, and then you have the seven days of unleavened bread. But we 12 disciples of the Lord were weeping and sorrowful. Now, if they've been meeting with Jesus 
uh, all week long and touching him and eating with him. I don't know why they'd be weeping and sorrowful. And each one sorrowful because of what had come to pass, departed to his home. I think that's very similar to this. I think this account, I know it doesn't fit John, but if you pull it up, I think this means they went back to the Galilee. And I'll show you why I'm convinced of that as we go on. That is, they went back to their homes. They were probably staying in Bethany with uh, Mary and Martha and Lazarus. That's where Jesus has his headquarters that week. Every morning he walks over the Mount of Olives from Bethany down into the temple and teaches all week. Now he's dead. And my guess is they had uh, their sad, sad Passover Seder at the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Try to imagine that. But I, Simon Peter, because this is the Gospel of Peter, and my brother Andrew, taking our nets, went off to the sea. And there was also Levi of Alphaeus, whom the Lord, and then unfortunately, it just breaks off. I wish we had the rest. My guess is it's going to pick up with what we get in John 21, that they're up on the Sea of Galilee, and that's where Peter sees Jesus. According to Paul, he appeared first to Peter, and Peter says, it's the Lord, and he jumps in the water and so forth, as you remember. So I'm suggesting that the earliest account of the resurrection of Jesus was the tomb was found empty. Two of the disciples went and investigated, the beloved disciple and Peter. They didn't believe in the resurrection yet. And after the days of unleavened bread, they went home. And Jesus had said, go to Galilee and you will see me. Okay, that's important. People forget that. He didn't say, I'll see you Sunday morning. It's called Easter. It'll be a new Christian holiday. Look at this, Mark 14. After I'm raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Um, in Mark 16, they enter the tomb. They see a young man. Now, this is, the, this is later when the whole entourage comes. You can imagine Mary Magdalene. It doesn't tell what she did. She went back and told, I'm sure, Jesus' mother, and Salome and all the others, I got the tomb, the tomb is empty, you got to come. And when they come, they see the young man sitting on the right side. It doesn't see an angel. So Mark is, I think, pretty being pretty objective here. No miracles, no earthquake. It's an angel. I mean, it, it's a young man in a white robe. He's a messenger. And he says, don't be amazed. You seek Jesus who was crucified. He's risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him, where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter. See how Peter singled out? He is be go he's going before you to Galilee. There you will see him as he told you. The earliest hope of resurrection is go to Galilee and you're going to see him. Matthew here also records that they go, the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. That's interesting. Now, Luke makes a shift. Luke and John are later. And some of you know this pretty well. It gets a little complicated, but John has chapter 20 that is Jerusalem, chapter 21 that is Galilee. Other than the first 10 verses of chapter 20, I'm discarding John. And I'm also discarding Luke as later accounts of resurrection in Jerusalem. And I think they developed later, and I think they're legendary, and I think the original appearances were in Galilee, as Mark, our earliest source, has, and as the first 10 verses of John have. And Luke says, according to Jesus, this is right, this is like the day he's resurrected in the Sunday evening, he says, stay in the city. Uh, wait a minute, stay in the city. So you got to stay in Jerusalem until uh, the day of Pentecost, which is 50 days later. Well, that just doesn't quite fit what we see in these other accounts where they go home, they go back to Galilee, and especially the Gospel of Peter, I think, that puts it together for us. Now, this came up before uh, when Paul mentions the testimony. He says he appeared first to Cephas, which is a, na a name, Peter's real name, Simon Peter, Cephas, the rock, his, nick, his, his, his name that Jesus gave him. 500 brethren, 
and then James and all the apostles, which we don't have a record of, and then he appeared to me. Why he doesn't mention Mary Magdalene? There are two possibilities. One is the testimony of women was not respected. If so, why is it in the Gospels of Matthew and uh, John 10, as Tina said? I think he just doesn't know all the story. Uh, and maybe this is kind of like a court case. Here's the official testimony, but he doesn't say where this happened. And I think this was up on the Sea of Galilee. Uh, John 21 parallels the theory that I'm offering you, the hypothesis that Jesus was first seen in the Galilee, not in Jerusalem. And the Jerusalem traditions developed later and they contradict the Galilee traditions. So we have Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of the disciples were together. Notice the sons of Zebedee are even mentioned here, and yet later you have the beloved disciple, who seems to be separate, who is one of these. Another argument that the beloved disciple is not uh, John, the son of Zebedee. I have nothing against uh, uh, Andrew, James, and John, the sons of Zebedee. They're pretty fiery guys. They want to call fire from heaven down and so forth. But John is a pretty common name, and I think it, it just got mixed up with legends in Asia Minor about another John that I also don't think is the son of Zebedee. Galilean fishermen generally don't uh, travel to the provinces. And they, he, Peter says, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we'll go with you. And they went out and got into a boat. And that night they caught nothing. As day was breaking, Jesus stood on the beach, yet his disciples did not know it was Jesus. He said to them, children, have you any fish? They say, no. He said, cast on the right side, you'll find some. They cast, now they were not able to haul it in for the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was Lord, he put on his clothes for he was stripped for work and sprang into the sea. Now, whether this is after the mountain encounter you know, the mountain in Matthew, whether it's an alternative account, whether it's a later account or before, I'm not sure. What was that? Somebody needs to mute. Maybe I don't think it's me. Somebody's maybe hitting their keyboard. That's not me, is it? No. Okay. Um, so this painting was done by one of uh, Daniela. Quebec, who went on our tour in 2013. This to me is the holiest spot on earth for studying Jesus, not Jerusalem, not Nazareth, not Sepphoris. I want to be on a boat. This is the cliffs of Arbel, right over Migdal. This is the harbor of Capernaum. Capernaum's over here. If they're fishing, they're fishing right in this little nook and cranny in the northwest of Jerusalem. And I will take you out on a boat. It's one of the highlights of the tour. And I will we'll park the boat and turn the motor off. And I'll read you the account. I believe this is where the faith was born. The faith was reborn. Uh, as the disciples saw Jesus on the shore, and they came to believe that he'd been raised from the dead in the Galilee, as he had said. And it's just uh, the painting kind of captures it for me. Now, is Mary Magdalene, is she from Jerusalem or Galilee? Uh, the reason I mention this, I'm going to give a lecture on the women that anointed Jesus, but there's an opinion out there. I don't think Tina shares it because she alluded to it today, that either the sinner woman in Luke who anoints Jesus or, the, or Mary, the sister of Martha who anoints Jesus is Mary Magdalene. I've really wanted to believe that. I've considered it. Uh, Jeffrey Butts is one of our friends and he's written about this. And I put his article on my blog and he said, James, it's a slam dunk. You're going to be so convinced. I'm not convinced. I agree with Tina and others. I think she is from Migdal. She's from the Galilee. And I think she comes with that entourage of women. Here we have the passage in Luke 8 that Tina referred to. Mary called Magdalene. 
Joanna, the wife of Cusa, Herod Steward. This is Herod, the uh, chief of staff. And Cusa is married to Herod's chief of staff. This guy gets to talk to Herod Antipas every day and get, tell him what the day's business is. And Susanna and many others, that's feminine in Greek, many other women, and they should translate it that way, and many other women, not men, who provided for them out of their treasury, their funds. So the Jesus entourage, I like to call it, the Jesus team, they're supported by a group of Galilean women some of whom have some means. It's been suggested that maybe her name is just Migdal, Mary the Tower, like Peter the Rock, but the Greek doesn't really seem to indicate that. Uh, yes, Magdal is from Migdal, which means tower. It means the city is the city of the tower, because we think it had a big lighthouse, uh, because it's one of the larger ports on the Galilee. It's actually uh, almost as large as Capernaum. Uh, but I don't think that, I mean, it's possible, I guess, but I think it means that she's back from Migdal or from Magdala. There's also in the Talmud the idea that Magdala, if you know Hebrew, Gadal, to make great, Migdala, the one who makes great, it can refer to someone who raises a baby or someone who grows hair, makes your hair grow, and others a hairdresser. I don't think that's the or origin of the word, although the Talmud probably, they like to make plays on words. So I think they are making a play on the words. So I go back to this synagogue. Uh, maybe there were other synagogues at Migdal, but this is the one that's been found by the Israel Antiquities Authority. Here is our stone or the replica thereof. This was taken very early on. It's more developed now, but I, like, I, I, I got to see this when the IA was excavating it and they were just about finished and uh, took this picture and I really do like it. And I like Jesus preached in all the synagogues of the Galilee. I think Mary is from here. I think they attended here together with other people of the movement. There's a certain way in which this is the center of the movement. Tina mentioned uh, the Gennesar area and the land of Gennesar, uh, literally the, the garden of the prince. I think, Tina, you stay at Gennesar when you dig at Bethsaida. I know when I visited you guys, you were there. And I stayed there a couple nights with you where the Jesus boat is. This is, to me, the holy area. Bargo Pixner began to feel that. You know, he loved Jerusalem. But he said when he got up to the Galilee, especially that arc of holy land from Capernaum down to Migdal, I'm telling you, I've sat for hours on those shores. I have had all sorts of meditative moments on those shores. I think that's where the Christian faith was born, not in Jerusalem. Now, does it take root in Jerusalem? Of course, they go back for the festival of Pentecost, and that's when the movement begins to root itself in that upper room that Jesus had also used for the Last Supper, probably owned by a wealthy patron. I've been digging at Mount Zion now for, um, let's see, since 208, and we've uncovered, as Tina knows, this fabulous, wealthy, priestly mansion. The upper room is up the hill from that, uh, but it has the same kind of uh, architecture and structure that it was a, the mansions on the hill of the rich and wealthy people are there, and Jesus has somebody there. It could be Joseph of Arimathea. It could be Nicodemus. Jesus has sympathizers from the priestly class that uh, are for him. They tend to be quiet about it in some ways, but they certainly weren't at the trial, which was pretty much a kangaroo court. Now, remember on Monday, I talked about Mary is always here. And uh, the way we identify Mary, if I'm not mistaken, is by the colors. I'm gonna have to ask Tina in the Q&A to clarify this. But some paintings also have women. And if this is Mary the mother, more or less the queen, right, of the movement, the queen mother of royal lineage, these are all the disciples. This certainly appears to be a woman, her head's covered. Perhaps could be one of her daughters, but 
you know, you usually you usually paint prominent people. This is supposed to be the day of Pentecost. So I'm going to guess that this is Mary Magdalene. So what happens? She shows up at the cross. She mysteriously is involved in the most intimate activities of the burial, washing a naked body of a male. She goes early to visit the tomb and finds it empty. Then she comes back, and this is the story Tina covered that's very touching, and she's hanging around the empty tomb, and she sees a gardener and says, you know, where have you taken him, and so forth, and, or somebody she thinks is a gardener, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm getting it wrong, somebody she thinks is a gardener, and then she hears his voice, and she says, Rabboni. Rabboni doesn't just mean rabbi. Rabboni, is, it, it means my dear master. It's, it's a term of uh, closeness. So I'm putting Mary, the mother, who's been faded away, after Acts 1, right? At least Luke says she was there. Luke doesn't say Mary Magdalene is there. I don't think Luke really cares much for Mary Magdalene. Um, he takes her name out three times where Mark includes it. And then finally, he almost has to mention it. And so he says, yeah, yeah, the women who came from Galilee. This is Luke 24, verse 10. Okay, yeah, she was among them. But it's certainly not prominent. And I think the women are being deep sixed. I think the women are being marginalized and particularly women who were intimate with the family, women who were very close to the family because we now want a spiritual Christ. We don't want the fleshly Jesus anymore. Isn't it strange that we wouldn't have lots of tales in the book of Acts about Mary Magdalene? How could she just disappear if she's so important and so prominent? And what about these other women? Now, two things have been proposed. One is that she, this is movies, that she's a companion of Jesus. I have, I have no problem with this image. I have no problem with this image. I think it's the sweetest moment of a man's life, which I've experienced five times because I have five children. And there's nothing more precious than coming up behind your wife and knowing that you're going to have a baby. It's holy, it's sacred, it's amazing, it's wonderful. This would be, as I recall the scene in the film, it's at the arrest of Jesus when she is with the entourage and uh, Jesus is essentially comforting her and saying, we're going to be okay. Have faith, Mary, we're going to be okay. Fiction, we don't have that account. But look, she didn't run away at the cross, right? And she didn't run away at the burial. And uh, Jesus does appear to her first. I agree with Tina. I think she is the first apostle. Uh, an apostle is someone who's seen Jesus. I think she saw Jesus first. I think the men saw Jesus in Galilee. But Mary got the extraordinary privilege of seeing Jesus in Jerusalem. She is then the witness of the resurrection. She's the first witness. And I don't find it so far-fetched in the Gospel of Mary and the Gospel of Philip and other mentions of Mary Magdalene that Tina referred to at the end of her lecture, that she is very, very prominent in the movement. And I, don't, I also think Jesus' mother was very prominent. Do you think James and the brothers of Jesus and the apostles who living on Mount Zion in Jerusalem in that little church of the apostles, that private house that was made available to them on Mount Zion, I mean, are they not going to consult with the queen mother of the movement, the mother of two of the boys who both die brutal deaths? And actually, Simon also dies a brutal death later if it's, his, if it's her son. She didn't live to see it, thank God, but he was crucified, and he was way up near 100 years old when that happened. So uh, I just, uh, you know, I, look, were they married? Did they have children? Were they, was she just a companion? How old was she? I don't know any of those things, but I do know that they were incredibly close. 
that she, along with the mother and the sisters, were allowed great intimacy in the inner, inner family activities of sadly disposing and taking care of the body of Jesus when he's died. And I'd like to dedicate this lecture to my friend and the, a woman I love deeply, Jane Schauberg, who died in 212 with cancer after a long battle. 